Let's get started with our event. So I welcome you all to the Blockchain Developer Series uh, Session 1 on getting started with Ethereum DApp development. So today we have Austin Griffith with us. Austin, Austin builds a lot of random things and try to teach each, uh, try to uh, teach other developers too. So he works for Ethereum Foundation, focusing on uh, developer onboarding, mentoring, and tooling. And he lives in Fort Collins, Colorado. So thank you, Austin, for joining us today. And the stage is yours. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Uh, GM, GM in the chat. What's up? What's up? Uh, let me switch to probably sharing my screen. Here we go. All right. We should have ethereum.org there. Great place to get started. Uh, I'm watching the chat. And feel free to just like ask questions as we go along. I feel like we can kind of go slowly rather than me just like shilling out a bunch of stuff. I'll just kind of like walk through my stuff. But as you have questions, please post them into the chat. Uh, getting started building decentralized apps. Uh, for me, I think landing on ethereum.org. Ethereum.org has a lot of resources here, whether, whether you're just learning how to kind of like use ETH or smart contracts or how to get a wallet, or you're kind of a developer looking to build and really get started. Uh, and, and if I dive into that, there's a few different uh, spots where I think are really good kicking off points. Um, I think the best thing for a developer to do is actually to start writing some solidity. If, if you are a developer, you'll pick up the language pretty quickly. But if you're not a developer or you're just getting started or you're kind of a developer, some of these options might be better. Uh, specifically, eth.build is, is the first thing I kind of want to shill here. Uh, eth.build will just take you through kind of very slowly, like what is a hash function? What is a key pair? You know, how do transactions work? And so, so this is a good way to just get started. And it, it allows you to kind of just like drag and drop uh, kind of make a little dashboard. This is my little gas dashboard. Whenever I want to know if how much it costs to use 250,000, you know, this is like an NFT mint and it costs about $16. So I, I have these little dashboards built, but you can bring in a lot of things from crypto. Uh, for instance, this is a key pair, right? I always like to show this off because I like to talk about how accessible Web3 is. By just clicking this button, I'm generating a new Web3 account, a new ECDSA key pair. So anybody anywhere in the world who wants to participate in Web3 or uh, this decentralized movement needs to basically generate a key pair. They don't have to have anyone's permission. They don't have to have, I mean, eventually you have to have ETH, which is kind of an elephant in the room a little bit that you have to pay gas, but we can get into that and onboarding a little bit more as we go through. Uh, but you don't have to have anybody's permission. You can basically just generate a private key, and from that uh, derives an address. Oh, awesome, thank you for that, that link there. Yeah, and I can also just like YOLO some of these things in here too. There we go, there's the ETH build thing. And I'm watching the Q&A and the chat, so just dump things into chat, uh, hit me up, like ask questions as we go, and I'm open to kind of follow different threads as we, as we go through them. But the first thread I wanna really pull at is this uh, permissionlessness this uh, global worldwide accessibility. If you have access to an internet connection, you can create an account on Ethereum. And that account is just a really big number. This is a 64 character hexadecimal string, but that turns, you know, that's just a really big number. A, a, a number between zero and two to the 256, right? So really, really big number. You can just generate one. And the fact is that this number is so big that it would take someone until like the heat death of the universe to be able to guess your, your number. If they sat here and tried to guess numbers all day long, there's so many of these that they'll never guess it. So there's this first piece of permissionless accessibility. Anyone can get to this, anyone, anyone can create a large number and that is their private key. And then they can use that private key to sign uh, transactions or even messages. And then those transactions are recovered on chain and they can you be used to cryptographically prove that you sent money or interacted with a smart contract and this is your address, right? So anybody has access to this and we just use ECDSA key pairs to, to interact with the network. 
And so that comes with the disclaimer, right? If anybody has access to this network, there's going to be tons and tons and tons of garbage. And so if you look at the surface of Web3, uh, it looks kind of like all the grifters moved in. And that's basically what Web3 is consisted of, right? But that's not true. And, and I want to start off by just giving you the disclaimer that you will have to go through a lot of junk to find the great stuff. Even if I were to go to the front page of OpenSea and look at some of these drops, like the things that are worth the most money, none of these to me are really all that interesting, to be honest. Like the artwork is cool, but there's not a ton of utility here. A lot of these are almost like kind of just like ironically cool. And that's why people are buying them. So just know that there's just a ton of garbage because anyone can create anything and the 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 protocol is based on money so people always think they can make a buck here so just as that as the disclaimer be careful web3 is is uh, kind of gross on the surface because anyone can get in and it's because it's permissionlessly e accessible right so just to start there with that big disclaimer uh if you want to get started with Ethereum, the best place to go is ethereum.org and get in here and kind of learn how uh, to set it up. You'll, you'll want to learn how to set up a wallet. You'll want to learn how to get some ETH. Uh, and then you'll start with learning how smart contracts work and how to program and how to code things. And that will lead you uh, hopefully to ETH build or something like Remix where you can tinker around. Uh, but eventually you'll want to set up your local environment and the local environment that I will be talking about today is Scaffold ETH, but there's lots of great ones out there. Uh, Scaffold ETH consists of hard hat and create react app. And so there's, there's a lot of similar things here. There's even, I think uh, a new one coming out is Foundry. It's not even on this list yet. We should probably get Foundry on this list, but there's lots of options out there and you should use whatever gets the job done for you. But today I'm going to talk about how Scaffold ETH really gets the job done for me and, and some of my friends and how that works. So uh, let's just skip over to that. Unless there are any questions yet, I'm going to dive right into Scaffold ETH first and kind of like work my way out of the onion in terms of uh, getting started building dApps. So um, decentralized apps, right? Dapps. They run on uh, Ethereum or some kind of decentralized blockchain. And I think a good metric for success, if you deploy an app uh, in, in the Web2 world, whenever we deploy an app, uh, we have this thing called uptime, right? You know, five nines, you know, 99.9% .9 .9 uptime, right? In Web3, if you deploy your app correctly, it, not even you can stop it right? It should never, ever go down. It should always be up, right? And it should always be accessible to everyone in the world. So that's, that's kind of like what we're, what we're trying to build here is these unstoppable, uh, ungovernable, or maybe the governance is built into it somehow on chain, but unstoppable apps. And not even you, if built correctly, should be able to stop your app. And, and we'll get into that as we go. So let's just look at Solidity just for a second. You as a programmer should be able to pick up Solidity pretty quickly. This is, this is a smart contract and you have a constructor and you have some primitives, right? Like maybe you could have a, a bool, right? A boolean and that could be, you know, some, some bool, right? Is true, right? Something like that. You'll, you'll have uh, strings. You'll have uh, numbers, as in a U256 public counter, right? So you, you have these primitives, and we'll set that counter to five or something like that. Just kind of writing some code in here just to show you that the syntax is actually pretty simple. If you're a decent coder, you should be able to pick up uh, uh, the syntax pretty quickly. Oh, someone asked, what is Web3? That's an interesting, so that's another thing that is permissionlessly accessible. Anybody out there can say that they are Web3, right? There's no, there's no branding or trademark on Web3. So a lot of times uh, people's definition of Web3 is, is pretty garbage also. I think one of the best uh, uh, examples I've had of Web3, what happens if you even Google Web3? What am I gonna get here? 
it's it's about decentralization at the core. Web three is about decentralization. If we think of Web one as sort of uh, people posting, uh, I like to think of it as the cost to write. So in Web one days, it was basically like me in my dorm room spinning up a web server, and the cost. Yeah, here we go. What is Web three? We're we're gonna answer it live right now. The cost of uh, writing in web one was I had to basically run a web server. Like if I wanted to run a website in a web one world, I had to know how Apache works and I had to spin up a Linux web server and I had to handle the traffic, right? Web two kind of abstracted that away and gave us a much nicer way to publish content. You could go to their website, you could type something up and you could hit send and you could write for basically for free and share that information with the world. Now, the cost to write in Web 2 is a little tricky because it ends up being very, very cheap in terms of monetary, but very, very expensive in terms of you or the product because that content that you just published is not owned by you. It's not controlled by you. It's owned by someone else and someone else is able to filter that. Someone else is able to censor that. Someone else is able to delete that or take it and use it somewhere else. And that's where it's like really scary. So web three, the cost to write is actually pretty expensive again because we have these node operators that are running this layer for us. But if you do it correctly, you own your own content and you're publishing it in a way where you control it. And you're, you're writing the rules in these smart contracts. And we'll get to that. But basically, uh, the, the cost to write in Web3 is, is monetary. Again, you can pay some money and there's a large substrate of node operators that are running this giant decentralized network. And so you're deploying on this substrate where when you deploy your app, you're not deploying to like one or two machines when we think of redundancy, right? You're not deploying to a couple machines. You're actually deploying to thousands of machines. Everyone on the network keeps a copy of your app. And when someone wants to run it, everyone on the network runs it for them and gives them the exact same results back. So this is a very, very redundant, very, very uh, censorship resistant network. And you, you pay for that in terms of the cost to mine a transaction and the cost to store that information across that network. And so only certain things need to be uh, written in Web3, right? Not, not everything needs to be a decentralized, unstoppable app. And we'll kind of dive into that as we kind of look through this stuff too. Yeah, Web3 is unstoppable code. Web, the, the key to Web3 is decentralization. And, and a lot of people will say a lot of different things about ownership and other things, but, but the key is decentralization. What is the problem with someone having? Yeah, I don't, okay. So yeah, I, hopefully I, I answered that uh, uh, a little bit. Go, go Google a little bit more about web two and web three. But if you imagine the web two world is something like Facebook or Twitter, where you're going to the site you're, you're creating content and you're sending it to them and they're storing it and it's super easy for you to write, but at the cost of you can be censored at any time, this content is on their servers, their servers can go down, they are in control of it and they choose how and when and who can see that information. So that, that's the kind of the difference. And Web3 is I can deploy this app that runs on all these machines and anyone can get to it, but it's a little bit more expensive because of that, that network, right? But the cost isn't you losing your data. The cost is different. The cost is monetary. And, and the, there's a good point. Is it 100% decentralized, right? I'm going to deploy an app today that'll go to Surge that could fall over, right? So only certain parts, like the, the smart contract, the settlement layer is 100% de decentralized, right? But then there could be these other layers on top of it where we're just using a signing key. You're using that ECDSA key pair we saw earlier to sign messages to attest to something, but that, that attestation could go live in a lot of different places, some of them being centralized uh, out there. But yes, it's, it's about the decentralized substrate that we're settling to and, and building on top of that. Hopefully I, I got that going. Uh, one really interesting piece of Web3 is that your identity and your inventory follow you from site to site. When I create, let me just log in. 
when I create Austin Griffith .eth here, this is this is my identity. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. This is my identity. And when I go to something like Uniswap, my identity follows me along. And when I connect my wallet here, here's Austin Griffith again, right? So so my identity and my inventory follow me. And those are things that are owned by my key pair. And another gotcha there is if you lose that key pair, that identity is gone, right? Forever. If you leak that key pair, your money is gone right away. So there's some elephants in the room here in terms of you have to have ETH to operate on the network. If you lose your seed phrase, it's gone forever. And we can dive into some of those things uh, here in a little bit. But the first thing I want to do at 20 minutes into it is to get you, the developer, or you, the curious party, started with Ethereum. And the best way to do that is to pick up speedrun Ethereum and to grab scaffold ETH. It said basically this line right here. Now there's a video, I would go watch it. It'll take you through the uh, an intro, kind of what we've sort of poked at already a little bit, but in more detail. Uh, but then it's use scaffold ETH, copy and paste the syntax. So we're, we're gonna go learn solidity, right? Copy and paste the syntax and learn, basically just learn the syntax. If you're a coder, it, it, you'll get it in no time. And what I mean by that is to go to Solidity by example. I'll paste it in in a second too. Let's see, Solidity by example, here we go. Boom, okay, so here is Solidity by example. I'm gonna paste it into uh, seed phrase and private keys are the same. Actually, let me, let me show that real quick. It's, it's, this is worth doing. So a seed phrase is a mnemonic. It looks like this, okay? And so uh, a private key is actually derived from the seed phrase. Okay, so the key pair is the key piece. This, this thing right here, this, uh, these two pieces are your key pair. It's a private key and a public address. Then there's this thing called a seed phrase, which makes it a little easier for humans to be able to reproduce. If I wrote this on a piece of paper in my sock drawer, it would be really hard for me to write that all back down, right? But if I wrote this in my sock drawer, I could probably rewrite this pretty quickly just because it's words and English, right? So this is the seed phrase. But what happens is what you can do is this, this derives a private key. So given a certain seed phrase or mnemonic, a private key comes from that, okay? And it's indexed so you can have, you know, account zero, account one, account two, and, and your private key is related to that, right? So you can have many private keys for one mnemonic. So given a mnemonic, you can have an index and that generates the private key. Let's go put that down here. There we go. And so instead of now, instead of generating private keys, I'm actually gonna derive a 12 word seed phrase. And so account zero from that 12 word seed phrase makes this private key, which then makes this address. So uh, you can use one easy to produce 12 word seed phrase to create lots of private keys, which will derive lots of addresses, which is what your MetaMask is. When you go set up your MetaMask, it will set you up with one of these 12 word seed phrases. Keep that very, very secret. Make sure you can bring it in and reproduce that anytime you need. Don't ever show anyone because it derives all of your private keys, which derive all of your accounts. Hopefully I dove in and covered that. Uh, no, the seed phrase is not an encryption. No, no, it's, the seed phrase is basically what 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 they're what you're doing here is hashing it. You're basically taking this big thing of text and throwing it into a hash function with the index and some extra information, and you're getting a, a private key out. Okay, and if if you guys want to cover this stuff, you we can you can you can dive in and learn a ton more about key pairs in this episode right here. Let me just like put this video into the chat. This is this video will cover private keys and make all of this stuff make a lot more sense, but I'm not going to dive in too far into it right now because I want to get you to, once you have the seed phrase, once you're interacting with the network, how do you really use that network and deploy decentralized apps? There we go. Oh, did I, am I posting? Hopefully that's going to everyone. Oh no, you're, yeah, maybe I need to, oh, I'm sorry. Let me put, okay, okay. I've got my chat set on everyone now. So now, <laughs> now I'll send them out to everyone. Okay, so uh, let's see, starting with Solidity by example. Let's, let's say you have your key pair set up, you funded it. You're able to talk to the network with that key pair. 
you're a programmer or you're getting into programming, how do you really uh, use Ethereum for what it's for, right? That is writing small apps. Basically, you write these smart contracts, these little uh, apps that run in all these machines on a substrate and people can interact with them almost like vending machines. We'll get to that. But here's how you get started writing those apps. So you go to Solidity by example, and I'll paste that into the chat. Okay, and you want to cover all of these uh, topics, right? You want to learn through, uh, you know, primitives and data types. Just learn, learn the syntax. We've got booleans, uints, integers, addresses. Learn how those work. This is probably the weirdest one, right? How an address is just like, doesn't even have quotes around it, right? Let's paste that in here. So a public, so we're tracking an address. Uh, it's public. Everything's public. It's a public blockchain. You might as well mark your things as public. This has to do with when you get into the syntax, you'll learn that like private stuff has to do with inheritance and access. But just assume that everything here is public. It's you want to mark it as public so your your app can see it. But uh, here here are a bunch of data types, right? And if you're a programmer, this stuff should make sense to you right away. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting, this is uh, using 256 bits. You can actually use like eight bits to track a number two if you want, right? Okay, let's go ahead and deploy this and this is what this is the the iteration loop i want you to get into so basically i've pulled down scaffold eth i've run the installation and i have uh my local blockchain running here which is hardhat i have my react app running here which is my front end and then i'm just deploying here i'm just doing a yarn deploy and it's going to compile and deploy my smart contract and then inject it into my app. So if I go to the debug contracts tab, now I can see my app over here. And you can see how these, uh, these are, well, get that out of there. You can see how these uh, data types are now showing up over here, right? So we have this address. I'm gonna go ahead and copy, uh, let's log out here. I'm gonna copy the address here and paste it in and we'll see that change, right? If I do a yarn deploy, we should see this address turn from pink guy into green guy. There we go, there we go. So your, your app, your front end is live updating. As you edit your smart contract, your app will live update. And this gives you the ability to tinker with solidity. It gives you the ability as a coder to come in here and just try things out, test your assumptions and see how things work. So basically we've set up, we're, we're gonna track this public address, uh, let's show how a function works, right? Let's create a function. We'll call it increment, okay? And we'll make it public. And what's it going to do? Let's just have it increase the counter by one, right? Very, very simple stuff. Uh, and let's go ahead and deploy that. So now we should get a new button over here in our front end. So we're just creating these interfaces that allow us to kind of access, let's see, so here's our counter and now there's a new increment button, right? And if I call that function, I'm actually crafting up a transaction and I'm sending it, it's getting mined into a block and all this other heady stuff. But for you as the builder, you know that you build the rules here and anyone can interact with that, but they can only run the rules that you have written here. So the only thing you can do here is it's going to be counter plus plus. It's going to do exactly what it's supposed to do. There we go. We see the counter go up six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So, so that's, we, we added a, a primitive, uh, counter, right? We added a function to increment that counter. Very, very straightforward stuff. If you are a coder, you should be able to pick this stuff up very, very quickly. So, wow. Okay. So I can code. I can write these smart contracts. I can put these apps out here for people to interface with. It has money at the protocol. I can build rules into that. What is this actually used for, right? And, and we almost have to dive in a little bit and talk about the differences between web two and web three and what places you might need uh, uh, this kind of permissionlessness. So uh, let's look at, oh, oh, so every increment, yes, every increment is like a full on transaction. In fact, when you're talking about cost, uh, gas costs, every line of this costs gas, right? So every line of execution, every little thing you do within the smart contract costs a little bit of gas. Now, when you store something, that caused a lot more gas. Like if we're just in a for loop and we're incrementing some variable in memory, it'll cost like 100 gas, right? 
But if you store something, it's going to cost like 10,000 gas or 5,000 gas. So storage is very expensive because all of these nodes across the network are running uh, uh, their, their version of the client. They're running an Ethereum uh, execution and uh, consensus layer, right? So when you store something, you're storing something on all of those machines. And so, and that's, um, first of all, the storage is expensive, but then when you have to craft up a transaction that has to get mined into a block, and so we have proof of work and eventually proof of stake, but an expensive process that the, sort of freezes that stuff into the block. So there's the cost of getting something on chain, but also the cost of just like storing these items on all these machines. How come the transaction went through without approval? Okay, we'll get to that in a second. That's burner wallets, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but what I want to do is just start to show some rules. And once I once I write this first require statement, the the whole approval thing will will come in. Feel free to drop questions in the chat. But here here's what I'm going to do. So this this smart contract is all about. I'm going to have some storage variables and I'm going to write some very important rules. Okay. And those rules are using a require statement. Okay. So I'm going to say require, let me even make this a little bit bigger. We'll make this really big. So I'm going to require, let's see, we have this, we have that increment. Now we have this function called set purpose. Let's, let's zoom out. Sorry. I should have like talked a little bit more about, so we have some string purpose that we're storing. That's creating unstoppable apps. Okay. And then let me delete that. Yeah, basically like this isn't important. This isn't important. Uh, this, we, we don't even need the event right now, right? So we have some string purpose. We don't even need this address right now. We have some string purpose. That's just a string that we're storing in the contract. And then we have some function that lets us set that string. So we, it lets us pass in, I can say, hello world. And I can hit send and it updates that purpose, right? And anyone anywhere can get in here and call that function. So the first rule I want to write is I want to make a require statement that says only, so I'm going to start tracking this new address and I'm going to say, this is Austin, right? And I'm going to say, uh, only Austin. So we're going to say require that, that, that the message dot sender, which is a global variable, we'll get into globals a little bit. Uh, but the message dot sender sender needs to be, uh, equal, equal to Austin or not Austin, not the owner, right? Not the owner of this or something like that, right? Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm setting a rule in, in the line of execution and I'm saying, when you get to this line, you make sure that the person that is calling this function is equal to this address or you revert and everything falls apart, okay? So I'm gonna start with that and I'm gonna go ahead and deploy that. Oh, something about E2 and gas fees. I, I'm not, I'm probably not the one to explain that. I think uh, almost everything is going to be the same in ETH2. The gas fees uh, will still be big. Uh, I think if you're worried about gas fees, you're going to be talking about L2. And we can deploy to an L2 if we have enough time, but I feel like we're kind of time constrained here. So I won't be able to do that. But gas fees are not going to go down in ETH2 probably, or in after the merge. We're not even calling it ETH2 anymore. It's, it's an execution and a, it, you'll get to it. Okay. So, uh, I've written a rule here, a set purpose function that should only allow me to set this purpose. And we can go test it by, let's pull it up. Let's make sure I'm green. This is Austin. Hello from Austin. And I hit send and it works. Okay, so how do we test the opposite of this, right? How do we create an, a second account, like a bad guy account, and get in here and test it? That's going to show us about burner wallets. So when I create a new incognito window and I go to localhost 3000, okay, it's going to create an account for me on page load. See this kind of blue green guy, right? Let's do that again. Let me close that and open up a new incognito window again and go to localhost and let's look and see what we get in the top right. There we go. We kind of get like this pink, pink and blue guy, right? So what's happening here is that private key that we showed earlier, it's creating one of those in the browser for you. So 
you can use these burner wallets for development and quick and easy transactions. And eventually when you get to a public network, you'll con connect your MetaMask and go, but this burner wallet saves you a ton of time and you don't have to have all those approval messages coming up. So a burner wallet is great for like local development and getting started and testing things. So we've, we've created a second account here and we're going to try to set the purpose from this other account, right? But for sure, it's not going to be equal to Austin. So it should throw, uh, this should not work, right? It should throw an error that says, not the owner. Okay, cool. So we're able to test this line here, this rule, and we're able to say, okay, let's make sure, and let's, let's go back here, this should work, right? because it's coming from this address and this address is the owner. And this is what I wanna show is you can just write a rule. You could test that rule using your burner wallets and you can kind of test your assumptions and get in here and, and write some code and write uh, uh, some kind of program to do something. Now, this thing has uh, money at the protocol, right? Well, I'm kind of less interested in uh, this kind of like heavy handed, this is almost kind of centralized, right? This set purpose function basically can only be run by me. And so I built this really redundant, really uh, censorship resistant permissionless app and only I can get in here and do anything, right? That's less interesting and not as, not, not really the use case, right? What the, a good use case of this is like, what if I wanna make this like a vending machine and make it so anyone can get in here, but they have to pay some amount of value to do that, right? What I'll do is I'll make this function payable and I'll create a similar require statement, but this time I'm gonna say the message dot value needs to be greater than or equal to, I don't know, like point zero zero one ether, okay? And then I'm gonna say not enough, okay. So what, like one line of code changed, but I changed the entire nature of the app. And me being able to get in here, oh, oh, my microphone just changed. Oh no. Okay, I think, I think we're good. We're good, we're good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just yeah. gonna keep going, <laughs> sorry. I think my no microphone problem. unplugged there, but okay. So we've changed this app to be uh, more like a vending machine that anyone can get to and they have to pay to use it. And that's what these kind of apps are a little more interesting. When, when you can write these rules and have money as part of the protocol, that's when this stuff starts to open up and make more sense. So let me go ahead and yarn deploy this. And so what it is, is almost like an, uh, uh, kind of like a message board, right? And anybody can pay, they can say, hello, message board, right? And they have to send in some amount of value. You notice I have about $17 here. Uh, when I send this in, it's gonna cost me, you know, a little bit of ETH, a couple bucks, right? Now, where does, where does that couple bucks go? Well, it goes into the contract, right? You'll notice the contract has an address of its own. And now that contract owns this money. So I've just paid $1.78 to set this message. And that's okay. Uh, this is just an example. Eventually this could be, you know, minting tokens, minting an NFT, locking it up, uh, doing all sorts of interesting things. Maybe you're attesting to some, uh, you know, event that has happened or something crazy. You as the programmer, uh, are, are very unlimited here. You, you can write any kind of program here with a Turing complete language that'll do anything you need, right? But it's like on chain and executing everywhere. So it's more expensive. So you have to figure out what kind of things really work on chain and what kind of things you can use uh, Web3 for. So uh, this is cool, but let's just, let's make it a little bit weirder, right? Let's go to, let's make a UN256 public price, okay? And let's do one other thing. After someone gets in here and they pay the price, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have that price increase. And this is, this is like always the demo I give. Sorry if you've seen this before, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say price equals price times 101 divided by 100. And this is gonna show off a few different things. First of all, there's no decimals. We, I know we're using a decimal here, but there's actually some magic going on here and I can explain that over here. But what I wanna do is I wanna do I wanna have the price increase by 1% every time someone sets it. And this accomplishes that. So if I go ahead and deploy that, then we should see, there we go. Okay, then 
Now the price is right here. Now what the heck? I thought we set with I saw, thought we set the price to 0 0.001 ether. What is this, right? Well, this is the difference between uh, ETH and Way. So when we're running these machines on the network, they need to be as simple as possible. The more simple the EVM, this little execution environment that's executing these smart contracts, if, if that is simple, then it's easier for other people to run. So this EVM doesn't wanna mess around with floating point math. So what we do is we have this little trick where we have everything as whole numbers, just really, really big whole numbers. And we divide everything by 10 to the 18 for decimals. So in this case, this is actually the same thing as this because it's a hundred thousand or yeah, one with all these zeros way is the same thing as 0 0.001 ether. So we as the humans wanna see it like this. If there was an extra zero here, I'd be able to notice it right away. But the machines don't want to mess around with floating point math, so you need to send them that, okay? So we have ETH and Way, and you just one of, another one of those gotchas you have to learn as you get into building on Ethereum. Uh, the second thing is also no floating point math here, right? I can't just do a decimal. What I have to do is first multiply my price by 101, and then second, divide it by 100. And that's the same thing as getting, uh, having it increase by, by 1%. Okay, so uh, sorry about the, the math. We had to kind of dive through it. We had to keep going here. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pay the price and I'm gonna say, hello world. And I'm gonna send that in, okay? And I paid and some money went into the contract. Everything worked exactly like it should, but something really interesting is happening. I'm not able to make that same transaction again. It's gonna say not enough. The price has increased. We, we correctly are increasing the price by 1%. Now, if I send that in, it'll work, right? And look, now the price has gone up a little bit more. So with a single line of code uh, here, we've basically turned uh, the price into a price curve just by doing like adding one line of code. And this is something I really wanna show off for, for the builders out there is this language is comprehensive enough that you can build any kind of weird financial mechanism or any kind of uh, you know, strange on-chain ownership mechanic, right? Just by writing a little bit of code, a little bit of like easy to understand code. So uh, another thing that's really interesting here is none of this is automatic. When we think of the blockchain and DAOs, it almost sounds like a, there's a lot of things that are like very automatic. But if you're a Web2 developer, you're familiar with something like a cron job. A cron job is something that kind of just needs to run periodically to like roll your logs or something like that, right? Well, in Web3, you wanna think of a cron job as being unstoppable. You can't just have a machine check in every night to the blockchain because that machine could fall over, that machine could get hacked. So to make something that runs consistently forever, you need to build the incentives and the rules correctly. So let's say, let's say we have this function called, I don't even know, compound interest, right? Okay, and we need that to run every night and we only want it to run once, right? So we as the programmers can get in here and we can set this up. So we, we, we would write something like this can only run, can only run, you know, once per 24 hours. And the way we would do that is we would keep track of the block.timestamp using block.timestamp, right? So we would get the timestamp from the chain when it's set the first time. And then we would say, you can, can't set it again until 24 hours later, right? So that's the first rule. This thing can only run every 24 hours. Then there's a second piece that's really key here, and it's the incentives. The incentives are very, very important in Web3. If you want something to happen, you need to incentivize it. So the second piece here is whoever checks in and runs this function gets paid right? They get paid, get paid maybe $200, right? Something like that, right? So we lock up money in our contract. We have the rule saying only someone can run this once. And then we have uh, a payout, an incentive for someone to get in here and run that compound interest. 
And that's what's going to create this unstoppable nature of this thing. And kind of zooming out, if you look at the blockchain at the whole, as a whole, this is similar to the process of mining. We're, we're financially incentivizing miners to crunch on that, that proof of work and put that block at the end of the blockchain full of the latest transactions. And they're incentivized both by the block reward and by gas. But again, if you're just learning blockchain basics, go back to ETH build. There's a great explainer on uh, the Byzantine general problem, distributed ledgers, and eventually blockchain. Dive in and check that stuff out. But once you get up to this level where you're basically just like writing apps, you need to know like kind of how to write these apps and what works and what doesn't. Another thing we see a lot of Web2 developers do is they get in here and they create uh, uh, structs that look like a, a database, right? They're like, okay, well, I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to have a, uh, oh man, I'm not doing well here. You're going to have a, you know, string first name string last name, right? This starts to look like a database entry, a UNT 256 balance, uh, you know, string address. Do not use the blockchain like this. Don't use it like a database. You need to think about minimum viable decentralization. What has to be on chain and what can live somewhere else? And so as you get in and start building things, yes, you'll use it for a database for a little bit, but need to, you need to understand that it's a very slow, very expensive database. Okay, someone just asked in the chat, what's the difference between a struct and a mapping? I want you to go learn that. And here's, here's how I want you to go learn that. I want you to go grab a mapping from Solidity by example, and I want you to paste it into your app. Okay, so we've got a mapping. And then a struct is, let's go find a struct. Let's go find a struct, structs. Okay, there we go, there's a struct to do, okay. So one thing is a mapping, one thing is a struct. I think, I think the, the question here is, what's the difference between a mapping and an array of structs, right? Yeah, okay. And the, the key, the answer to that question, if we were gonna start with the answer and work backwards is you can iterate through a mapping and you can look through all your to-dos, but you can't iterate, or you can iterate through an array. I don't know if I said that right. You can iterate through an array of structs, but you cannot iterate through a mapping. A mapping is kind of uh, like, given, given some address, there's a uint, that's uh, associated with that. So this is a good way to put this is balance, right? This is like given some address there, and this is a UN256 to be more explicit. This given some address, there's some number that's associated with that, okay? And so this would be like balances. Let's go ahead and just deploy that. Will it let us? We can kind of tinker with this a little bit more. But if you wanted to look through all of the balances of all of the participants on chain, you couldn't use a mapping for that. It wouldn't work. If you needed to look through, say, say you needed to take votes, right? Say we're, we're running a DAO and we want to have everyone vote on everything and we'll keep all the votes as a struct. We need to keep all of those votes. If we have to have all those votes on chain, which is going to be expensive, we'll have them in an array. And when we need to count the votes, we'll iterate through that array in a for loop and we'll add up all the votes. But if you don't need to iterate through and add all those things up, then a mapping works much better. It's much cheaper. It's basically creating a, a mapping uh, from an address to a number. And let's let's go ahead and play with that. So how do I learn what a mapping is? I go to Solidity by example. I go to the mapping section. You should you should go through each one of these. Uh, in particular, I, I highlight the ones that are almost the most important. And really, if you get through these first three, you're ready to get started with the challenges. So basically, go to speedrun Ethereum. Whoop, 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 whoop. There we go. Go to speedrun Ethereum. Okay. Go through that video. Download Scaffold ETH. And go through these first three things, learn global units, learn primitives and learn mappings, and then get started. And then you'll need to come back here and learn structs and modifiers and events and inheritance a little later. And, and that'll be for the rest of the challenges. But what I mean by go learn, I mean, okay, we wanna learn mappings, right? So you're gonna go to solidity by example, you're gonna go to mappings, you're gonna paste it into your code, and then you're gonna tinker with it. So a mapping is really like just keeping track of some mapping from one address to, or from one uh, primitive to another. In this case, an address to a number. So if we go look at that, I think I've deployed it here somewhere. Yeah, the balance, right? So if we go check the balance for this guy, 
it's going to be zero, right? Okay, so let's actually, ooh, our constructor's gone. I kind of want my constructor back. Uh, let's do something like setting the balance of Austin to 100, right? Let's go ahead and deploy that. I don't know if I need to make this public or something. Let's see if it complains. Nope, it's happy. Okay, so now when this deploys, we'll get a new smart contract and I will go to that smart contract and we'll ask it for Austin's balance. Yeah, now it's a hundred, right? Okay, so then let's write another quick function called transfer, okay? And that'll have some UN256 uh, amount and then some address two, right? You'll have some two address that you're gonna transfer it to and some amount. And what does a transfer function does? It's really simple. What does a transfer function do? It takes the balance of the message.sender, whoever's calling this, and it subtracts the amount from it, right? And then it takes the balance of the to address and it adds the amount to it. Simple, simple, simple programming. But guess what we just did? We just created a token, right? A token basically consists of a mapping of balances and some function to let people transfer for it, right? And let's just dive in real quick. If I go here, I can see that I have a balance of, if I check my balance, I have a balance of 100. Uh, if we pull up some incognito window and we go to local host, kind of some secondary character, yes, yeah, so a purple guy and green guy. So let's copy purple guy's address and let's go find that transfer function. So now I'm gonna transfer 10. And by the way, I'm, not, I'm, I'm doing way here, not E, so I'm not gonna run that. I'm gonna transfer 10 of 10 way of my token to this address. Now, if I check my balance again, guess what? I bet it's gonna be 90. And then if we go over here and we check this dude's balance, it's 10, okay? So we just created a token, uh, which is nothing more than a mapping, a collection of who owns what, and then a transfer function that lets people transfer from theirs to someone else's. And let's just real quick double check that everything works. What if I try to transfer to this guy 100? This should fail, right? Because I don't have enough. There we go. Yeah, we get overflow. Very nice. So it's, it's checking for that kind of stuff uh, underneath the sheets. What is the meaning of scaffold? I mean, scaffold is like a building scaffolding, right? Scaffold ETH is like a, a project where everything works out of the box and it has everything set up for you. And you can get in and tinker with the heart of the thing, the solidity first, and then kind of work your way out and, and understand how that interacts with React, understand what kind of things are meant for smart contracts and what aren't, uh, et cetera. Okay, I do not have enough time to explain uh, uh, kind of like uh, a lot more here. I wanted to talk more about uh, uh, kind of like what, what works here. So I probably will skip some things, but uh, just a couple of commands you can yarn generate. This is gonna create a, a new deployer account. Then I can fund this account. Say, say I wanna go to mainnet, right? So right now I'm deploying locally. If I wanna go to mainnet, I can fund this with a small amount of let's say Covan or, and this could be mainnet ETH, right? I could send mainnet ETH to this address also but I'm just gonna send a small amount of Covan to this address. And now I can yarn deploy dash dash network Covan. Probably you can't see that. Let me make that bigger. What I wanna show is that you work locally, you get your app working the way you want. Uh-oh, was there a MetaMask dialogue there? Oh man, I hope it worked. Okay, and then once you've got your local setup ready, you can deploy it to, to a public network. You can deploy to any other network. What it's gonna do is do all of this st same stuff, but now it's going to a public network and I'm paying real money. It's test net money right now, but I'm paying real money to deploy that. Then what I could do is I can do a yarn build and I could take my app and I can put it out on surge or something like that. So. I need to make one other change to my app. I need to point my app. So this is the front end. You'll get in as, as you go to speedrun Ethereum and you go through this stuff, you'll kind of learn all of this stuff. The first, the first challenge takes you through this, but basically I wanna turn this app and point it at Covan. So now my app will change from localhost to Covan. And now all of the things that we were just tinkering with, we actually just deployed a token to Covan, right? And we could hit the compound interest button for some reason. <laughs> That's probably not going to work. Uh, but I can check my balance out here on Covan, right? And I can actually send uh, a real Covan uh, 
transaction here, right? This is going to send a real transaction on a real network. Oh, I don't have any money on Covan, but I need Covan. And I can yarn build this and I can deploy this app. So, so this is kind of like the zero to one with Scaffold ETH. You tinker locally, you get it working, and then you deploy it to a public network and you deploy the app that talks to the smart contract on the public network. So that's like, the, this is your getting started. Once you kind of get this tinkering and you're ready to build more, this is where Speedrun Ethereum really helps. It takes you through building a decentralized staking app. It takes you through building a token vendor. A lot of these things are specifically like what Ethereum is good at. Uh, for instance, uh, this staking app lets people that don't trust each other, right? If we, I, we, we have five minutes, I don't have enough time, but if we wanna talk about trust for a second, let's think about escrow. If I wanna sell a pair of shoes to someone that I don't trust, we're almost certainly gonna have some middle party, some escrow, some central party that both of us may not tr may trust more than the, the the other party right someone that we can both kind of trust someone that has no you know uh buy-in or anything here so so i was just trying to sell the pair of shoes oh no did the microphone just go off again bro microphone why okay we're selling a pair of shoes if i was going to sell a pair of shoes i and i don't trust the person i'm selling it to who, who gives the shoes and who gives the money first is the question, right? No, like, no, you give me the money first and then I'll give you the shoes. I don't want to give you the shoes first and have you run off. So that's why we need escrow, right? So I would put, I would give the shoes to a trusted third party. They would give the money to a trusted third party. And if the trusted third party has both things, then they kind of give the shoes and give the money to the, to the right people, right? There's this escrow, this trusted middle thing. This is kind of what Ethereum is. It is this, this middle trusted layer. But instead of trusting a human, you have to trust the code. You basically are trusting that this smart contract is going to do exactly what it says. You know, uh, if uh, like take in shoes, take in money. If I have shoes and money, distribute money and shoes to the opposite parties, right? So what Ethereum lets you do is it lets you write these applications where people don't have to trust the participants. They only have to trust the code. So this very first app lets is a staking app. It lets uh, uh, adversarial group of people, people that are uh, adversarial to each other, people who don't trust each other can get in and use this app and stake funds and basically uh, you know, coordinate financially. And you couldn't do that before. You, you really had to have some trusted middle layer. And what this, this new substrate does is create a, a trusted layer that is basically written in code. It's just, it's, it's like programs that are the trusted middle layer. So that's, that's kind of like one of the superpowers of Ethereum is you can build these vending machines. You can build these apps that anyone can get to and they don't have to trust anyone else other than the code and the network is going to, and they trust the network and the code is going to do what the code is written to do. So you'll, 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 you'll get in and you'll use it for a database for a little bit, but then pretty soon you'll start realizing, oh, this is the kind of thing that this is for. And, and you'll get in and you kind of write these programs to, to use blockchain uh, in the correct way. So a token vendor, uh, a dice game is a new one. So randomness is really tricky on chain, right? It's a public deterministic blockchain. So randomness is hard. We teach you how to build a dice game, but then how to attack the dice game. Uh, building a DEX is really interesting. If you want to exchange tokens for value, you usually have to go, you used to have to go through a centralized order book system. Uh, now there's basically, there's a way to do that in a smart contract. You can just set the smart contract up to have reserves of both and you can trade between those two and the fees are left behind and it's completely decentralized and no one can censor it, no one can shut it down. Uh, a multi-sig wallet uh, is a way to store funds in a smart contract and have like two out of three signers have to sign off on it. So it's almost like you have to take a vote to send the money. And then SVG, NFTs and Oracles and a lot of other fun stuff. Uh, there's a lot there. Sorry, I kind of like had to go so fast through this. Here is speedrun Ethereum. Oh, I pasted it in a million times. That's the place to get started. Uh, also, my DMs are open. Let me throw my Twitter up here too. Uh, if you have any more questions, sorry, I wasn't able to answer a lot of questions here. Uh, but my DMs are open. I am this dude. Thank you so much for having me.
Thank you all. Uh, hit me up in the DMs. They're wide open. So ask questions there. Sorry, I got to jump. Thank you for having me. And uh, just let me share my screen. Sorry to take so much time. <laughs> it, it, it was perfect timing. Mean, yeah. Thank you, Austin, for such a wonderful session. And I really hope all of you got some gist of how to get started with the app development on Ethereum. So yeah, uh, if you have any questions, uh, ping it in the chat or you already got contact of Austin. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining today's session. And note that the recording will be available in a few weeks. So you, you can uh, get the link in the Slack. So thank you everyone. I wish you all a pleasant evening. Bye. Thank you, bye. <laughs>